Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Hallelujah. Well, Shabbat Shalom. As you know, we've been in a long, long series in the book of Mark. Today, uh, you'll be glad to know, is the 43rd and final part. <laughs> so we're going to finish the book of Mark today. And we're going to look at the last chapter, chapter 16, which is the glorious chapter of the empty tomb and the resurrection. Hallelujah. So turn with me to Mark 16, beginning in verse 1. When Shabbat was over, Mary Magdalene, Bram, the mother of Yaakov, and Salome uh, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Yeshua's body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, uh, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Yeshua, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Hallelujah. All four Gospels tell us that on Sunday morning, on the biblical Jewish festival of first fruits, later renamed Easter by the church, uh, the women followers of Yeshua went to the tomb to complete the process of, of anointing the body with spices and perfumes, but they found the tomb empty. And they saw an angel who told them that Yeshua had risen from the dead. And even though Mark's account here is very short, you've actually got here the entirety of the life-changing message of the resurrection. I want us to look today at three aspects of it. We'll put it on the overhead. Three aspects of this. Uh, number one, a word of challenge to change your mind. Number two, a word of grace to change your heart. And three, a word of mission to change the whole course and scope of your life. So first, a word of challenge to your mind. Look at Mark 16, verse 6. Don't be alarmed, the angel said. You're looking for Yeshua, Hadnatsri, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Now, this is a challenge to the mind. Think of this. There were dozens and dozens of Messianic movements in Israel in the decades before and after Yeshua's death. Uh, and in every case... Uh, the Messianic leader was killed. And in every other case, other than Yeshua, after the death of the leader, the movement collapsed. Everybody went home. That was it. That's why today you've never heard of them, of all these other uh, um, movements, so these Messianic leaders and these movements, because the leader was killed, and they all quickly collapsed. All except this one, Yeshua faith. But of all these dozens and dozens of messianic movements, only one that did not collapse after the death of its leader. And not only did it not collapse, but it exploded. And after the, over the next 200 years, it essentially took over the Roman Empire. And today, it's by far the largest religious faith on the face of the earth, as well as by far the most diverse faith in terms of geography and adherence from every tongue and tribe and people and race and ethnicity and nationality and socioeconomic class and background. Now, what made this Messianic movement so different from, from all the other ones, all the rest of Israel at this time? Uh, because, as I said, uh, there were dozens and dozens of, the, of these Messianic movements whose leaders were killed. Why is this one so utterly different because this leader, after he was killed, came back from the dead and appeared to his followers multiple times over 40 days, sometimes as many as 500 seeing him at once. That's what changed everything, the resurrection. Yeshua faith rises or falls on the resurrection. 
If somebody wants to debate with you uh, about the Bible, do not get distracted by, by thousands of different little rabbit trails. Start and focus on the resurrection. Everything rises or falls on the resurrection. And even secular scholars say the accounts of the resurrection, whether you believe in it or not, that these accounts are some of the best attested to eyewitness accounts in history. The resurrection changed everything. And that's why the Yeshua followers did not go home. That's why the movement exploded. Now today, in the secular West, most people just don't believe in this. Uh, okay, but then you need to come up with an alternative, a viable alternative explanation. But in fact, no one has been able to come up with one, to come up with a, a compelling account, uh, alternative ac explanation for the empty tomb and the eyewitness accounts uh, and the changed lives of the disciples and the explo explosive growth of the movement worldwide. And this lack of a viable alternative explanation to explain all these facts, it's gotten so bad that some of the, today some of the leading atheistic and skeptical scholars, like Bart Ehrman, for example, they've told their followers not to try to answer this question of, of coming up with another explanation, but just to say, we don't believe in the resurrection, period. <laughs> Now, the scriptures try to say, and I'm sorry, the skeptics, <laughs> the skeptics try to say, number one, these texts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, were written many, many years after the case. Number two, they're legends, not history. And number three, therefore, we can't really know what really happened, what the real events were. But Mark challenges that. He challenges your thinking. Uh, in, in three times in Mark 15, 40, 15, 47, and now in here in our text in Mark 16, 1, three times in just eight verses, Mark interestingly writes down the names of these women who saw all this. You know, he, uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, Miriam, the mother of, of James and Joseph, and Salome. Three times Mark lists them by name. Why this redundancy? Well, Richard Bauckham, one of the foremost biblical scholars in the world today, he wrote this classic work I recommend called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, in which he says that the Gospel of Mark has all the marks of the way that historians did history in the first century. Ancient historians gave far more credence to the oral histories of living eyewitnesses, still living eyewitnesses. They put these, these first-hand sources even, is even more valuable than, than written documents. Why? Because if eyewitnesses were still around, if they were still alive, you could speak with uh, and cross-examine them. Uh, you could check out and compare and corroborate what they said. And therefore, living eyewitnesses were always the source of choice for writing history. And on the overhead here, as Richard Balkan points out, uh, that when you see these, these, these women's names being listed over and over again, what you actually have here are the earmarks, not of legend, but of actual history. Mark listing all these names is the first century equivalent of today's scholarly footnotes. These are citations. Mark is citing his sources. These women were still alive at the time when Mark wrote his gospel, or he wouldn't have named them. He's basically saying, these are some of my eyewitnesses, my original first, first-hand source material. If you want to check out my story, go talk to them. This is amazing. Uh, they're still alive. This is the way historians made use of eyewitnesses. And the implication of listing them by name is that they're still alive and you can talk to them and corroborate what I'm writing. What Mark is saying with putting these names down, he was saying, anyone reading this document can check out what I'm writing by speaking to these women. Now, this is not how legends were written. This is history. Here's another reason why it can't be legend. Uh, Celsus was a, a Greek pagan philosopher who lived around 80 years after the time of Yeshua. He hated Messianic Judaism and Christianity. And he wrote a number of books trying to refute Yeshua faith. And he tried to list all the reasons why he thought the gospels could not be true. And you know what one of his strongest arguments was? He said, one of the reasons we know that Yeshua faith can't be true it's because the accounts of the resurrection are based on the testimony of women. And we all know, he said, that women are just hysterical. 
And everybody in the ancient world said, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> now, why did Celsus know this was such a strong argument back then? Because in ancient cultures, women were marginalized. And so it was hard to believe in their testimony. But, but when did, I think what this means, though. This means that if Mark was making this up, he would have never put women in as his only original eyewitnesses of the empty tomb. The only possible reason to explain women in these accounts is because they were the first ones to actually see him resurrected. The only way to account for these women being depicted as the first eyewitnesses of Yeshua's resurrection is because they were. And therefore, this can't be legend. Uh, they wouldn't be here given the bias against women if Mark was, writing, was, was making this up and writing a legend. They wouldn't be here unless it actually happened that way and Mark is just reporting the facts. This is an historical account. And Mark is simply recording history as it happened. Mark is challenging you to use your mind. Uh, you see that the gospel account is an historical document. It really happened. Uh, indeed, if you study the gospels also from even just from a literary perspective, you'll see that they were not written uh, as legends. They're written in a literary form of actual history. Uh, and if they're not history, it would actually be a form of realistic prose fiction. But the problem is realistic prose fiction was not invented until the 18th century. <laughs> so, for example, we all see these little, little details all throughout the Gospels that don't really advance the story. Like, for example, Yeshua telling his disciples to cast their nets in the water, and they caught 153 fish. Why add in the number of fish caught? I mean, commentators have been speculating about this for thousands of years, what this might mean, trying to come up with all sorts of mystical explanations. But the fact is, these little extra details, they do nothing to advance the narrative, to, to advance the story arc. But they are marks of first-hand eyewitness reporting. They're there because the gospel writer remembered it and wrote it down. We have the same realistic approach today, uh, like the modern novel, where the writer adds in all these little extra details. Uh, for example, the novel might say, uh, today's novel might say, she came to the door, she turned the knob, the door creaked, uh, the wind blew through her hair. That's the way we write fiction today. But this form of literature did not exist in the first century. Legends existed, but legends did not put in all these kind of little details in the story. They did not write fiction like that in the ancient world. Uh, you'd never hear, for example, you'd never read that Hercules walked across the room. He pulled out the bowl of fruit. He ate his breakfast. Uh, he burnt the toast. <laughs> no, legends don't have these kind of minor details. The Gospels are not written as legends. They're written as history. They were received as, as historical accounts, even by non-believers such as Josephus and, and Tacitus. Now, critics up to about 1940 said the Gospels must be legends because they weren't written down until you know, at least 100 or more years after the events. But research and archaeology over the last 80 years, including, for example, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the discovery of earlier and earlier New, Test New Testament manuscripts, uh, has pushed it back and pushed it back and pushed it back so that almost all scholars today say that the Synoptic Gospels, of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were all written by around 70 AD, within 40 years of Yeshua's lifetime. And Paul's epistles were written within 15 to 20 years of the events, within 45 to 50 AD. Now, legends take hundreds of years to develop. But these are all contemporary accounts. And if you're going to fabricate something, think about this. You can't do it while the eyewitnesses are still alive. So, for example, if I said in the year 2000, which is 22 years ago, which is about as long or longer after the events than the events that Paul was writing about. He wrote down within 20 years. Uh, if I said in the year 2000 there was a major earthquake in Dallas and hundreds of thousands of people were killed, that would never get off the ground. Nobody would believe me because most of you were around back then and you know it didn't happen. So my story would be de debunked. I'd be immediately denounced as a liar. If you want to fabricate something, you've got to wait until all the eyewitnesses are dead so nobody can contradict you. But the New Testament documents, they're written within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses, of the original eyewitnesses. So they would not have been accepted if they had been made up as fabrications. People would have contradicted and debunked uh, and denounced them. People would have said, 
The tomb's not empty. People would have said, no one ever saw him alive, let alone 500 at once. But no one ever said that. No one ever denied the gospel accounts. No one ever claimed that these were fabrications. They were written down during the lifetime of the original eyewitnesses. They did not slowly develop over hundreds of years like legends. The gospels are historical accounts, not legends. Well, the next, next objection is to say that, well, ancient people, they were credulous. They were naive about these. They were very gullible about these kind of things. They, they easily believed uh, in miracles and in the supernatural accounts, unlike we sophisticated moderns today. You know, we modern people, we know miracles can't happen. Uh, indeed, the fact is, secular, skeptical, modern people have a built-in worldview bias that makes it impossible for them to believe in the resurrection. Uh, so modern people won't even consider it, regardless of the evidence. But back then, so the argument goes, ancient people were open to such stuff. You know, they were quick to believe in things like, like the resurrection. But we now know today, it can't be true. But Mark challenges you on this as well. Throughout the book of Mark, again and again, Yeshua tells his disciples, I'm going to rise on the third day. He repeatedly uh, announces this to his Talmudim. He says, uh, I'll die, but I'll rise on the third day. I'll rise on the third day. But now notice in our account, it's now the third day. It's Sunday morning. But none of Yeshua's apostles are at the tomb waiting for the resurrection. In fact, none of his male, uh, male disciples are around at all. And his female disciples aren't much better. They've, yeah, they've gone to the tomb, but they've gone with spices and perfumes to anoint a dead body. They were expecting a corpse, not a living or resurrected Messiah. Despite what Messiah told them over and over again, no one was expecting the resurrection. None of the disciples were sitting around saying, hey, you know, it's the third day. Maybe we ought to take a look at the tomb, huh? You know, couldn't hurt. Maybe we should check it out. Yeshua said, third day, third day. He's dead. It's the third day. You think someone would have said, maybe we should go and look. But no one does. No one says anything. They were not waiting for or anticipating the resurrection. They were not expecting it at all. They weren't even thinking about it. In fact, the angel even tweaks uh, the women about this. Look at Mark 16, 7. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. Uh, you, then you'll see him, what? Just as he told you. The angels were reminding them, he told you about this. And they still didn't get it. Mark 16, verse 8, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, why would Mark write this? He absolutely wouldn't have written this if he was making it up. But here's the point. The resurrection was as inconceivable and impossible for them to believe in the first century as it is for people to believe now in the 21st century. For different reasons, yes, but still almost impossible for them to believe. Contrary to modern people's critical view of what people were like back then, you know, people in the first century were not gullible or naive or prone to believe any miraculous claim. No. Well, the Greeks didn't believe in resurrection at all because the Greek view was salvation is liberation of the soul from the body. So there's no way in their worldview that a bodily physical resurrection would be part of salvation. For the Jews, some like the Sadducees also didn't believe in resurrection. Others like the Pharisees, yes, believed in resurrection, but they believed it was a future general resurrection of all the saints at the end of time, at the renewal of the world in the Messianic age. But first century Jews had no concept of an individual rising from the dead in the middle of time during this present age. So if you have doubts about Yeshua's resurrection, Mark's trying to show you they had doubts too. They were not predisposed to believe in the resurrection. Yet something happened that changed all of that. They saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. C.S. Lewis says, we tend to be guilty today of what he calls chronological snobbery. It's assuming people in the past were primitive and naive and credulous. But that we moderns, well, we're sophisticated and enlightened, and we progressed beyond belief in things like miracles and the supernatural. 
But as we've just shown, shown in the first century, they couldn't believe in the resurrection either, though for different reasons. As you know, we Jews, both then and now, would be the last people on the face of the earth to worship a human being as God. The concept that a human being could be the resurrected son of God was just impossible in the Jewish worldview. It was impossible from their worldview. But they did believe it. Tens of thousands of devout, orthodox, first century Jews believed it. Why? Because they let the evidence challenge their worldview. A lot of modern people are just being intellectually lazy. They're saying, our worldview doesn't make it possible for us to believe in this, but it wasn't possible for the first century Jewish worldview either. Then why did so many of our people believe? Because they had the intellectual integrity to let the evidence challenge their worldview. Do you? Do you? If you doubt or question or disbelieve the resurrection, then you have to come up with an historically possible alternative explanation for these four facts on the overhead. How do you explain that? Number one, the empty tomb. Two, Jewish people embracing Yeshua as Lord. Three, their radically changed lives, their willingness to die for their faith. And four, the Yeshua movement exploding all over the known world and changing the entire world in a way that no other group has ever done. You need to come up with a, a viable, plausible, alternative explanation. You have to come up with uh, reasons for why hundreds and hundreds of people say that they saw, physically saw the resurrected Yeshua, sometimes 500 at once, who were still alive when Paul was writing about this and could, and could be interviewed. And why it changed their lives. And why they spent the rest of their life preaching it and dying happily for it. You need to come up with a plausible alternative explanation. And after 2,000 years, no one has... So on the overhead, number one, this is a, a challenge for your mind. Number two, the resurrection is also a word of grace for your heart. Look at Mark 16, verse 7. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him just like he told you. Do you see what a word of, what a word of grace this is? Notice that Yeshua did not say, you tell those faithless, backstabbing cowards that, that, I, that I might see them uh, if they grovel. Uh, and they better grovel if they have any hope of me reinstating them into my movement. Yeshua did not say that. Although it would have been perfectly warranted if he had. Because you know what they did to him. Uh, how they all abandoned him and, and denied him and, and fled. But here is what Yeshua was saying. Notice he doesn't respond the way we would. We say, you faithless, backstabbing losers, <laughs> if you repent, uh, I might somehow maybe love you and forgive you again. But Yeshua says, I love you and I forgive you to make it possible for you to repent. Yeshua says, I will see you. I'm going ahead of you. Uh, I still want you to be, to be part of my movement. He's forgiving them even before they repented. He's forgiven them so they can repent. That is a word of grace. But there's even a bigger word of grace here. It's the word Peter. Yeshua, through the angel, look at this, says this in Mark 16, verse 7. Go tell his disciples and Peter. Why does Yeshua single out Peter apart from all the rest of the disciples? He could have simply said, tell the disciples. That would have included Peter. Why specifically mention him? You know why. Because you know the story. That, that little additional reference to Peter, it's both pastorally practical and theologically profound. First, it's pastorally practical. Imagine if the message had, been, had just been, go tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee. I'm going to see them up in the Galil. If that's all Yeshua had said and, and, and it conveyed to the angel, to the angel, to the women, that's what, they, they, that's what would have been conveyed to the disciples who are there are sitting around now along with Peter. And the message is, Yeshua wants to see you in Galilee. Do you know what Peter would have said? 
He would have said, you guys go. That can't mean me. Not after what I've done. Because Peter denied him three times, just as Messiah prophesied. But Yeshua specifically says, I have loving plans for my disciples. And that means you too, Peter. You see, this is pastorally practical, but it's also theologically profound. Because Peter ends up being, being the biggest leader, being the head leader, even though he was the biggest screw up. But on the overhead, here's the theological profundity of the gospel. Because Peter's screw up was the biggest, his repentance will be the deepest. And his grasp of grace will be the greatest. And that will make him the most qualified person to be the leader of Yeshua's messianic movement. Now, this is somewhat counterintuitive. This isn't the way the world thinks, but it's the way the kingdom of God works. The last are first, and the first are last. It's, it's why the kingdom of grace works. And the overhead. Religion and understand salvation is by strength. I'm saved if I'm good. I'm saved if I'm morally and spiritually strong. I'm saved to the degree that I'm strong and I live up to standards. And in that view, failure and repentance disrupts the flow of God's power. Because salvation is for the strong. And, and you've just been weak. And that disrupts failure and repentance. It's episodic and, and traumatic. Religion says that this disrupts the flow of God's power in your life. On the overhead. But the gospel is not religion. The gospel says this view of God is all wrong. All wrong. Because the gospel says salvation is by grace. Not by your works. Salvation came by, by the weakness of Yeshua. Dying for you on the cross. And Yeshua's salvation is received by you when you admit you're weak. Uh, and admit your own inability. And admit, I need a savior. And the overhead. And if that's the case, then repentance after failure enhances, not disrupts, but enhances the flow of God's power in your life. We hate admitting failure. We do everything we can to, to avoid it. Uh, we say, well, if you had my mother, if you had had my father or my bad upbringing or my situation, we blame others, we blame circumstances, we blame society, we do everything we possibly can to avoid taking responsibility. We do everything we can other than repent on the overhead. We do everything we can to avoid admitting failure, to avoid admitting any moral or spiritual or personal failure. Why? Because it feels like a death, a death to our ego, a death to your pride. But if you let failure drive you deeper into the gospel, it becomes a resurrection. If you let your failure drive you into the gospel that says you're saved not by your works in the past, but by Yeshua's work in the past, then do you know what happens? Do you know why it becomes a resurrection? And the overhead, because your repentance drives you deeper and deeper into the gospel, which means you come to see more than ever the costliness of his love and the radicalness of his grace. You see your own flaws, yes, but you also see how infallibly and infinitely and endlessly you are loved. And that makes you both humbler and bolder at the same time. Nothing else does that, only the gospel. The gospel gives you greater self-knowledge and greater self-forgetfulness. Nothing else does that. And on and on, you grow and you grow because the biggest repentant, repenters become the biggest lovers. And, and ultimately, they become the best leaders and counselors and parents. Do you see how radical the gospel is? It's a word of grace. And this word comes at the resurrection. Because the resurrection means your sins are forgiven if you're in Messiah Yeshua. When a criminal completes his sentence fully satisfies his sentence uh, so that the law has, has no more claim on him, he walks out free. Yeshua came to pay the penalty for your sins. It was a huge penalty, a, a huge sentence, but he must have satisfied it fully. You know why? 
Because on Sunday morning, fulfilling the feast of first fruits, Yeshua became the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. He walked out free. And that is God's way of stamping paid in full right across the statement of all the charges against you. And because Yeshua was raised from the dead, God can now come to you with a word of grace, saying, like Peter, the biggest follow-up, 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 the biggest screw-up, the biggest death to self will lead to the greatest resurrection on the overhead. So number one, this is the, the resurrection is a word of grace, is a word of, of challenge for your mind, uh, to challenge your worldview. Number two, it's to take this word into your heart and let it soften and change your heart. Let it be a word of grace for your heart. And now finally, number three, there's a word of mission, a word of action that will reshape the whole way you live in this world. In fact, there's two words given here. Uh, don't be alarmed and go and tell. Go tell the people about the resurrection. Go and communicate in every way about the resurrection. Do not be afraid. Go. And the overhead. And this means if you understand the resurrection, it gives you one, freedom from the world, and number two, freedom for the world. First, freedom from the world. Why is it so hard for us to face suffering? Why is it so hard to face your death or the death of a loved one? Why is it so hard to face sickness and suffering or or persecution and opposition? Why is it so hard to do the right thing when you know it'll cost you? It'll cost you money. It'll cost you your reputation. Maybe even cost you your freedom or your life. Believers throughout history have faced tremendous persecution for taking a stand for Yeshua. Do you know why it's so hard to do the right thing when it's going to cost you? Do you know why it's so hard for us to face the problems in this world? Because we think this world, this broken world, is the only world we're ever going to have. We feel like this money is the only money I'm ever going to have. This body is the only body I'm ever going to have. This life is the only life I'm ever going to have. But the doctrine of the resurrection uh, doesn't just say, oh, oh, someday you'll go to heaven and get consolation for all the things you've lost down here. But the doctrine of the resurrection is that the Lord is going to renew this material world. Which means you're going to get back all the things you've lost. And, and you're going to get all the things you never even had. Uh, you'll be given this material world in its perfected state. Joni Erickson Tata was in this terrible accident uh, when she was 18, became a, a quadriplegic, uh, paralyzed from the neck down. Uh, I visited her ministry in California a couple years ago. She's confined to a, a wheelchair. She attended this uh, Episcopalian church where during the service, not everybody was supposed to kneel. And that just drove home to her the fact that she was in a wheelchair. And every time the priest would call the people to kneel, she couldn't do it, and she burst out in tears. And then one day during services, when the priest called everybody to kneel, she was about again to burst into tears. But then she started to pray about the resurrection. And suddenly it hit her. And in her book, she writes this. We'll put it on the overhead. I suddenly realized that when I get to the wedding feast of the Lamb, the first thing I'll be able to do with my resurrected legs is to drop down on glorified knees and kneel quietly before the feet of Yeshua. And then I'm going to get on my feet and dance. Can you imagine the hope she writes that the resurrection gives someone who is spinal, who's spinal cord injured like me? Can you imagine the hope this gives someone who's just manic depressive? No. No religion, no other philosophy other than biblical Yeshua faith promises us new bodies, not just new minds and hearts. Only in the gospel do people who are hurting like me find such enormous hope to live. If you can't kneel or you can't dance, and you long to dance, in the resurrection you'll dance perfectly. <laughs> if you're lonely, in the resurrection you'll, have, you'll be loved perfectly. If you know this is not the only world, this is, this is not the only body, this is not the only life you're ever going to have, but that one day you will have the perfect life, a concrete life. Uh, then who cares what people do to you in this life? Who cares even if, you, if your life is threatened? 
because you're going to get a so much better life. That is the hope and the promise of the resurrection. The hope of the, res of the resurrection enables you to act courageously in this life and face adversity uh, and suffering and opposition and persecution with supernatural joy and a sure hope. So on the overhead, first resurrection gives you freedom from the world, but then secondly, finally, it gives you freedom for this world. The resurrection proves that God loves this world. Every other religion, every other religion conceives of salvation as an escape, as an escape from this material world. Your soul goes into heaven, or you go off into another realm of consciousness, uh, but the resurrection proves that God doesn't just want to save souls, but bodies as well. He, doesn't, he just doesn't want to save the spiritual, but the physical as well. The resurrection proves that God hates disease uh, and poverty and hunger and sickness. And that's why, for example, we have a mercy fund here at Etzkaim. Uh, because as the Lord's servants, we hate these things too. This material world matters. We care about men and women made in God's image. The resurrection proves God cares about and loves you. The resurrection, it really happened. Now, can you imagine uh, if the original Messianic Jewish believers in the first century, can you imagine them going out into the highways and byways and preaching to the poor, preaching to the poor, preaching to the slaves, which they did, and saying, let me tell you about the resurrection of the Messiah. It didn't really happen, but it's a wonderful symbol. It's a wonderful metaphor uh, how, for how good triumphs over evil. So let's just all be nice to each other. Can you imagine the slaves and the poor of the Roman Empire saying, ah, this is just what I needed to lift me up above my life of grinding poverty and depression. No, of course not. That was never preached. And if it had been, it wouldn't have helped or inspired anybody. It never would have changed people's lives. It's not what the disciples and the other Yeshua followers ever said. No, the original apostles and disciples and preachers said, we saw him. We touched him. God has come physically into this broken world. And someday he's going to put everything right. And finally, in terms of the resurrection giving you freedom for this world, I want to encourage you to proclaim this amazing message of the reality of the resurrection. To proclaim it to your friends, to your family, to your neighbors, to your co-workers, and your classmates, and your gym buddies, and, and to the ends of the earth. And when I say proclaim, what I mean is to boldly preach the gospel, the good news of the, of the resurrected Messiah with authority, even if it risks ridicule and suffering. As Peter, who was the apostle to the Jews, as Peter said this in 1 Peter 2, Verse 4, we've come to him, the living stone. He was rejected by men, but chosen by God. And then Peter says, likewise, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are called to be the light to the nations, to proclaim to Israel the fulfillment of her messianic hope. And too often, though, we wait passively for gospel opportunities to present themselves to us on a silver platter. We defer proclaiming the gospel to only the most suitable situations, or we avoid it altogether. But if we wait for the perfect opportunities to share our faith, they may never come. And we'll be like that foolish farmer of Ecclesiastes 11 who observes the wind but never sows, who considers the cloud, uh, but never reaps. Such farmers have empty barns in the winter. Likewise, if we are all too cautious, we'll likely never see a harvest of souls. So in a world that is ever increasingly hostile to the gospel, we may need to reset our expectations of, of always waiting for, for a favorable audience before we speak. Yeshua says, you're going to be insulted uh, and ostracized. So be prepared. Do not shrink back. Let's pray for God to give us boldness. Uh, the Lord will bless us as we step out for him in faith. You know, throughout the, whole, the book of Acts, we find repeated examples of authoritative witness, 
even in the face of suffering from the apostles and the other first century Jewish believers. We find them proclaiming the gospel and speaking boldly. We read of them reasoning in, in, in the synagogues and persuading others. We observe them testifying before the religious rulers and the secular government. We see them bearing witness before civil crowds and angry mobs. In the scriptures, the gospel is announced and proclaimed and preached because it's God's spectacular news. The scriptures say the last days will be like the days of Noah. People will be eating and drinking and going about their lives, and then suddenly destruction will come. When Yeshua returns, judgment will come swiftly and when least expected. That's why we must proclaim the good news of Messiah. That's why we must declare it with urgency. Even to those who scoff at our message and mock our faith. Even when it involves risk. The urgency of our message propels our motivation. And by the way, I'm not talking about stormy hell and, and, and brimstone rhetoric. We want to convey the joy that Yeshua brings to our life. We're called uh, as, as priests to declare God's glory and forgiveness and to proclaim his praises. Yes, we're to preach Yeshua crucified, but we do so glorifying in the cross. We exalt in the Lord. And in our adulation, it overflows to others, telling them how he's delivered us from darkness uh, in his glorious light. In other words, worship is essential to evangelism. We praise that which we most enjoy. And our enjoyment is not complete until we've communicated that joy to others. So, for example, whether it's a great movie or an awesome song or a breathtaking vista of nature, our joy finds its fulfillment in the expression of our praise, declaring our experience and our discoveries to others so that they enjoy it too. That's part of what it means to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We're to sing to the Lord. We're to declare his glory to the ends of the earth. The Lord has given us in Yeshua this priestly ministry. We're called to declare God's praises to the world. So if you're not faithfully proclaiming the gospel, perhaps it's because you are not overflowing with praise to God. If evangelism is lacking, it's often because our praise and worship is also lacking. We're good at bragging about our favorite sports teams, uh, raving about our favorite restaurant, telling others about this deal we found online, talking endlessly about the latest Amazon or, or Netflix series, waxing eloquent about this or that favorite politician. But ask us to raise our voice in praise to God outside of this shul, and we struggle. And we stammer and we stutter at the opportunity to proclaim to others our heavenly hope. But since we're so quick to praise other things, it's obvious our gospel silence is not because our mouths are broken. It's because our hearts are. So let's worship the Lord as we should, such that it, it endlessly overflows uh, uh, in, in, in praising his name to our neighbors and our coworkers and our classmates and our friends. Today, even today, May a personal encounter with Yeshua transform your heart in worship and send you running to others in praise of his name. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand and pray. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let the music team to come on up. Thank you, Father. We thank you today, most of all, for the fact that Yeshua is risen. When the women went to the, went to the tomb, it was empty. He wasn't there. He was resurrected attested to by hundreds of eyewitnesses over 40 days. They saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. They couldn't deny it. He's risen. You are alive. And that changes everything. As Paul said, our faith rises or falls on the resurrection. Yeshua, you are the first fruits of those who rise from the dead. You guarantee our future resurrection. Hallelujah. Thank you, Yeshua, for loving us even while we were yet sinners. Thank you for making forgiveness possible by your returning sacrifice on the cross. Your love and forgiveness is what makes it possible for us to repent. And despite what we've done, even if we've denied you like Peter, 
Your grace is there for us today, calling us to repent. So, Lord, we repent. We turn to you. We turn from our sin. We turn from ourself. We turn to you. And we turn to others to proclaim the good news of your resurrection, Yeshua. So, Lord, give us a boldness and a courage to declare the wonders of your love and the, and the forgiveness and mercy and grace that you've made a way for us on the cross. Help us to declare your glory, to proclaim your praises to others, Yeshua. For you who called us out of darkness into your marvelous light, let our proclamation be fueled by our worship. Let it be an overflow of our heart of praise and thanksgiving to you, Yeshua. For we pray this in your name. Amen. Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom.